Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Hupp, Artistic Director at Syracuse Stage. Thank you for joining us for this sort of behind the scenes conversation uh, about your week of day. And we're very fortunate to, today to be joined by Gwen Weber McLeod. <laughs> Gwen has been such a good friend to Syracuse Stage, advising us, uh, consulting with us, helping us uh, chart our course forward over the past uh, several years now. Uh, and so, Gwen, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about Eureka Day and your reaction to Eureka Day. Uh, right. Gwen, you were so kind to come and meet with our cast mm -hmm. during the rehearsal process to consult yep. with us and to give us your insight uh, into the play as it appeared on the page. Uh, and I know our actors were thrilled to meet with you and, and hear your insight. Uh, and so now here we are, this is being recorded the Monday after opening weekend. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and so you've had a chance to, to see the show. You were with us on opening night and we were so grateful to see you there and I'm just wondering as we have as, as you've had a little few moments perhaps to reflect what was your primary takeaway from the experience of being there on opening night and and, and your reaction to this play you know I um I had a couple of thoughts but it's just the cliff notes of them were you know sometimes we have to laugh to keep from crying was one mm -hmm. of the things that I thought because what we are currently going through in our country is so exactly like what this executive committee of the Eureka Day School is going through. And it the play brings out the complexities, the personal perspectives, every single leadership dynamic that people are going through. And I was simultaneously laughing hysterically while internally saying, wow, this is just so hard for everyone. And that it's a moment where everyone could be right and it's that tension of how do my personal beliefs and values bump into what I as a leader need to do for the greater good. And I understand that difficulty, both personally and professionally, as I discussed with the cast, I'm the president and CEO of a leadership development corporation. The other thing that strikes me is something that always strikes me when I come to your theater is just how you truly, your technical team, has the ability to create these sets that are so realistic that you almost forget that you're really in a theater. And so just the um, visual appearance, the design of the set was so beautiful, so appropriate, um, and really allowed me to be completely immersed in that classroom, in that library with them. So I had sort of this personal reaction and both a technical reaction to it. And then just really thinking about you know, how things really do repeat themselves in history and a desire that I hope that we get the lessons because it's truly like building a bicycle and riding it at the same time, right? The very moment you think you have the bicycle together, the, you know, the wheel falls off and you have to lead your way to put the bike back together. So it really brought up a lot of emotion for me. And it also um, touched that part of me that just loves life theater. I said to my husband, it's so interesting to be able to work with my colleagues who allow me to sit at the intersection of leadership and the arts, in this case, um, theater. You know, speaking of leadership, uh, um, you know, there are, you know, the, the, the character of Don, who is yeah. the, the headmaster, uh, who really finds himself uh, in some ways caught between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect in your, uh, in your professional world, you'd have a lot to say to Don, uh, and maybe to Su Suzanne as well about how, uh, you know, the, the, the course of events might have gone a little more effectively and a little bit better. Right. Uh, um, I mean, that, that's a, to me, there's some leadership lessons perhaps to be learned in, in, in the absolutely, play. Absolutely, absolutely, Bob. You know, when, we, when I talked to the cast after just reading the play and then actually seeing Don in real time, you know, a couple of things that, that really resonated with me is just, that is going on and, and every single one of my client organizations and in organizations and companies, regardless of industry or sector across our region right now. And that people are truly trying to find their way to how do we demonstrate, verbalize a commitment to things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then get our real time behavior to match with those words. And the dilemma Don faced with is that this his school had all of those values at play, 
And as things happen in almost every organization that we work in is my company and that I'm a part of when something really challenging hits, if there's not effective leadership in play, those values will quickly fall away in the very dynamic and interesting ways those values fell away. So had Don been my client, I would have really talked to him about the idea that everything really rises and falls on your leadership, Don, and how you prepare not only yourself, but this executive committee to address these issues is gonna be critical. And one of the things we talked about when I was talking with the cast were the importance of understanding that when you lead what you're really doing on a daily basis is causing change for the people that are your customers, your clients, in this case, the parents and students of Eureka Day. So you have to become, de de um, develop a, a, an expertise and what it takes to get people to thrive through change. And then the other conversation I had with the cast was just the role that trust plays and how it's about how you behave and not what you say. So those would have been two things I would have prepared Don to be thinking about as the headmaster. And do you, did this play uh, sound, the, the characters in this play and the situation that was mm -hmm. created by the play, uh, um, did it sound particularly absurd to you or were there things that, that you've seen in your own work that, uh, that rang true to you in terms of the inner dynamics and the, uh, the way this group dynamic evolved over the course of the play? It was not absurd to me at all. It, you know, I, I was, it re, I literally watch that unfold regularly in my client organizations. And so I think I'm, I would be curious as to how other people who are leading in organizations dealing with trying to manifest a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion simultaneously while dealing with COVID, which is also bringing up diversity, equity, and inclusion issues are reacting to that reality, right? Because when you're in it as a leader, you will get in your car and be like, that was crazy. When you see it performed that way, I know it was hitting me in a very interesting way because that was not absurd at all. I literally see those dynamics happen from the point of them of giving the appearance that they were fundamentally a well-oiled machine who was making great decisions to that tipping point that caused that significant breakdown. I see that happening and my company is in the business of supporting leaders who are navigating those dynamics in their own organizations. It isn't absurd to me at all, which is the part that made me say, sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. Right, right. Uh, because when you come and see the play, you know, the, the outward show, the posters, uh -huh. the commitment yep. to EDI, the, the you know, there's one uh, post that says every child is an activist and they have right. their core values that include integrity and diversity, <laughs> kindness and citizenship. And then we okay. see all those values just go right out the window right. when things get tough. Right. Uh, um, and we also see, I, I wonder what, what your reaction was to, there are, you know, there are two women of color in the play, mm -hmm. two, two white men and a white woman. Right. And, the, and, 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 you know, the white woman's character, the character of Suzanne has right. most of the power in yeah. the group because she's right. the, the, the chairman. Uh, um, and we, but we also, we see a lot of, of microaggressions in this mm -hmm. play. Uh, we see there's one male character who continually cuts everybody off and uh -huh. doesn't let them finish a, 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 a thought. Uh, um, there is, I think, a, 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 you know, there was an outward show of we are inclusive and we are committed to EDI. I don't know if their actions carry through on that very well. Uh -huh. I wonder if, how those components landed with you uh, in, in your experience. Well, you know, they, they were very realistic because what I think we're all observing, and I think COVID has exacerbated it, is that I would say that the um, things that happened in America in 2020 that I think were escalated and elevated by the murder of George Floyd triggered something in people who had never even thought about, let's talk about equity, right? Equity and inclusion in particular. And everyone scrambled to issue a statement, get their values out there, right? Put the pretty words all around them. The reality is that I always say to people, you cannot train your way out of the complexities of being a leader in an organization that has diverse people in it. You can't train your way out of that. 
you can only lead your way out of it. So what I'm observing in real time is that people will go to the diversity training, work, they, that, that group executive committee had the lingo down pat, you know, right, the exactly. whole thing with the drop down. Um, they had all of the veneer. And I believe that in my real time, that most people in their hearts want to do the right thing. But there's a whole nother dynamic in knowing something. You got to close the knowing doing gap is what I call, right? Mm -hmm. You can know about those subject matters. But when you have to do the work of getting people, in that case, the executive committee, to get on some common ground and agree about the actions you need to take as a leader, that's a different ball of wax. And I, what I saw happening with the Eureka Day executive committee is what I see happening in my client organizations, which is everybody goes to the workshop. Everybody, most people have the intellectual and academic capacity to understand what diversity, equity, and inclusion are. Where they get jammed up is closing that gap between knowing what it is and having to figure out what to do about it. And in that gap, if someone's not leading properly, you will see the collapse, right, that we saw in that group, because all of that stuff bubbles just below the surface. So some of what I you know, want to invite the people who will see this and see the play to think about is, you know, we talked about this a bit with the cast too, Bob, that as a country, at least as a, from my African-American perspective, and other people of other cultures can lay their own perspective on this, we've been for 400 years trying to figure this out and cannot do it, right? We are like, have the habit of racism in my case. So then you layer on, we have the habit of sexism. We have the habit of otherism. We have the habit of not honoring our colleagues, brothers, sisters, family members who are members of the LGBTQI community. And so if that's a habit, then it's almost kind of ridiculous to believe that just because we say something that we have the ability to line up behaviors and strategies and goals to make that happen. And in that space, that's what my company does, right? That we will go in and help people who know it get, because you have to develop the courage and will to do it, right? To translate what they know into a set of actions that has a positive impact that then enables them to live out those stated goals and values regularly in their organizations. And I, I think we particularly see that, you know, one of the one of the things we see in this play is a transition of leadership. Yes, that was interesting okay. to me. <laughs> I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that, because we move mm -hmm. from Suzanne, who clearly we learned in the course of the play was one of the founders of the school. Right. She even, she even at the, when she's challenged and backed into a corner, she even refers to the school as my school. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and then we have on the other hand, we have uh, uh, Karina, mm -hmm. who is uh, new to the school. Right. Uh, and who has been invited to join this group because she's a new parent. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, some of the other members of the group make assumptions about her right. uh, that turn out to be untrue. So what would you, how do you see this, this power dynamic shift and, and mm -hmm. how did that, this, how did that land with you in, 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 as you watch the play? Yeah, that was one of the most powerful things for me to watch that happen and to watch that shift. And it was so interesting because the tension between Suzanne and Karina played itself out as subtle and not so subtle implicit bias, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, what do they call it? Like unconscious bias and well, uh, some of that bias was very conscious on her part. And that's what I mean, right? That Suzanne is a classic example of someone who obviously got the lingo, went to the workshop, in her heart of hearts was trying to be that a diversity champion, let me say that, be, an all, be that person on the executive committee who was very inclusive until the issue pushed up against something that was very personal to her. Then all of her stuff came spilling out, right? That's very common. I say you just scratch below the surface. So I was having these moments with Sue Ann like, lady, <laughs> I'm gonna need you to get it together because you are not recognizing how racist you sound right now. And I loved the subtlety of Karina's physical reaction to all of that. So that was really interesting to me because that happens all the time, right? I do executive coaching with minority women leaders who talk about that happening, that thing happening to them all the time. 
The other thing that I thought was powerful, which is something that I would invite people listening just to think about, is how empathy, right? Just finding a moment to have some empathy can put you on common ground with someone. So I was feeling all kinds of ways about Suzanne. And it was interesting. It impacted me differently to see it than to read it. Mm. At the moment where she shares her personal story, that is the foundation. So for why she's reacting to this whole mandate, the way that she is. And watching Karina humanize Suzanne in that moment. And I, I think this happens all the time. I've been, I am guilty of it, right? That you are so accustomed to having to put on the full armor of God to go outside every day that you can't imagine unless you work on it that you could be on common ground in any way with someone who is being blatantly racist to you. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so watching, they got on common ground as women and mothers. And mm -hmm. I thought that that was a really powerful moment and just for like a fleeting second because that's the way I see it in real life. Just these fleeting moments where we get on common ground because empathy comes into play. I think for anybody who's watching that, that's a powerful leadership lesson. And how do you, when you're in sitting in that tension, find those questions to ask people that will get them on common ground. Then that whole thing that went down about who should ask Eli, when Karina found some footing as a leader and became the person that asked Eli, Suzanne's shock that she was the one that was now emerging as the power broker is not uncommon, mm -hmm. right? And then there was a part of me like, be careful, Karina, because you can become Suzanne if you're not <laughs> careful in your own way, um, I think was shocking to her. And then Eli wielding his own power, which we see in organizations all the time, the person, the donor with the most money, if the leader is, and the board is not careful, will become the power broker in the organization because they have the money. That whole thing was very interesting and how it led to Karina surfacing as starting to behave in many ways, the whole meditation piece, right? right Very right. much like the people she was given the side eye to in the beginning. And then her surfacing in her language and the way she was moving, I had that thought like, Karina, I'm gonna need you to get it together because you could become Suzanne in this situation. So I found that whole thing to be interesting and very realistic. So much of it happens in the nuances and the subtleties. I, I love your insight into this because that the complexity of the relationship between Suzanne and, and Karina and then the fact that up until about three quarters of the way through the play, I think, and you could hear the audience sort of vocally opposing Suzanne. I mean, they right. were right. they were definitely in camp uh, Karina. You could tell that that was, that because right. when she finally pushed back and found her voice in the play to stand up to Suzanne, the audience reacted very vocally and very favorably right. at that point. And then later in the play, you learn a little bit more about Suzanne that kind of humanizes her, that mm -hmm. we understand why she's taking some of the vaccination stance right. that she's taking. It doesn't erase the way she's been treating people, but right. it, at least, it, as you said, it humanizes her a little bit in terms of why she feels mm -hmm. the way she does about vaccinations. Right. But then in, in that, Karina has a very strong point where she talks about um, uh, the, the idea of getting vaccinated. And the mm -hmm. idea of, of others getting vaccinated as really, in, in some ways, a social justice issue. Right. Uh, uh, that uh, that she and, and she, I thought that she made that point in, in an interesting way. And I wonder, uh, did you find uh, 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 truth in that conversation where she pushes back against Suzanne and says, "We have to trust the science. Uh, you know, your 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 story is a very sad one, uh, and 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 our hearts are broken because of it." Mm -hmm. But we have to also understand that there is a greater good at play here. Uh, and in many ways that can tie into a social justice issue as Absolutely. well. I wonder if that resonated at all for you. It resonate, resonated very much to me. If I could just say something quickly about that moment with Please. Dan and Karina, and then I'll get to this real quickly for you too, Bob, is the other thing that struck me in that moment is that even as much as Suzanne's story resonated with Karina as a mother and a woman, there was still so much white privilege at play 
on Suzanne's part, right? And so the thing I think our, my white colleagues don't get all the time is that I have great ability to get on common ground with you. What I need you to constantly reflect about is how your privilege because of your whiteness is still at play even when I can have empathy for your situation as a woman and a mother. Because mm -hmm. up until that very moment, Suzanne was on one, <laughs> right? But it, and that's the that's sort of the give and take that people of color are dealing with all the time. That I can find empathy with you, even after you have blasted me with your privilege. And so that that's where that trust thing comes into place, right? Like, and we've all, for the most part, at least in my family, were raised to do unto others, as you you know, to be kind, to be forgiving. There's this whole conversation in the black community about respectability politics. I think it's generational. And so that's one of the things that struck me as well, that we still have to recognize that even in those moments where we can get on common ground, America's 400 year history of privilege based on skin color is still at play. And that's what makes it hard for people to get into high trust, high performing um, incidents. Mm -hmm. With regard to Karina's um, conversation about being vaccinated as a social justice issue. I think that's, that is the tension point that's being played out in America right now. That whole thing about this is my body, I get to choose what I wanna do with it against, and then you walk into a building where there's hundreds of other people. And it's, I'm looking at especially what's happening in healthcare right now, um, that I do think it becomes a social justice issue if people have the ability to think it to the point of who is most likely to be impacted by a lack of vaccination, right? So statistically speaking, we're seeing that it's potentially children as their numbers start to escalate and communities that have historically been dealing with health disparities, right? Black and brown people are the ones who die. So there was sort of that um, intellectual piece of that for me in that, you know, what do we do for the greater good, right? And do we have the ability to do things for the greater good? As a country, I think we have some experiences with that until it pushes up against someone's um, feeling about personal freedom. I found that to be very powerful. And I think that if communities and organizations could find a way to have that conversation and try to strip away blame and judgment, we might be able to find some answers that could kind of work for most of us, right? Um, and I didn't experience Karina throwing that around, like she wasn't weaponizing that point of view, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know how some people say, oh, some people play the race card, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't experience her as weaponizing it, I think that she felt at feel, felt feels as strongly about that as Suzanne does about the fact that her daughter might have died as a result of having a vaccination. And where there are extremes, someone's got to find, especially in organizations, find a way to get people on middle ground. So do I believe that the vaccination debate that we're sitting in now is a social justice issue? I fundamentally think it's a medicine, medical and scientific issue, but we're being naive if we don't pay attention to the social justice impact. And, you know, today we all woke up to Colin Powell dying, right? And they're saying that he was fully vaccinated and died from COVID complications. And I have two thoughts about that. You know, he's someone who my father paved the way for as a, as a Black Army officer in a segregated military and the new Secretary of State um, uh, Mr. Austin is like a brother to me. He's like a family friend. And so I'm having that whole reaction, right? And then I also thought, and what is the fact that Colin Powell, who was fully vaccinated, died from a COVID-related complications going to do to the debate even in my own community about this? And so I think we have to be willing to look at it through those lenses and when we're leading, be cognizant of the fact that for some people, this is a social justice issue. It's the reason many black people don't want to be vaccinated, for example, mm -hmm. right? The Tuskegee experiment, um, that Harry, I think her name is Harriet Latt, you know, the, the woman who had her cells taken. Right. So there, if you're leading in this moment, 
It is so important for you to elevate your own awareness of everything that's walking through the door of your organization every single day. And how do you continually turn that Rubik's cube to get some colors to match up in a way that you can set policy and practice for your organization? This is a, a, a master class, uh, Gwen, <laughs> uh, uh, um, and 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 I really have learned so much just sitting here listening to what you're saying and, and uh -huh. giving me giving me insight into this play. And I mean, right. this is the wonderful thing that live theater can do right. is it can can encourage us to think about the uh, things that we interact with in our own lives, perhaps mm -hmm. in a new way or a different way or a way that we hadn't thought of before, because mm -hmm. we can see these fictional characters come to life and yet they can have real impact in our own real lives. Mm -hmm. I'm and, sure people saw themselves in the characters. Oh, I'm sure they did. The other thing, Bob, that I just thought was so interesting is every single thing I had to do just to enter the theater. So yes. to observe Syracuse stage, having to take all of those protocols, right? Have me show my vaccine card. Give me the sticker that indicated that. The new rules about, you know, being in your um, bistro area. Mm -hmm. All of that, I thought to myself, I'm wondering if other people are making connections between what we just did to come into this theater to see this play and the realities of what and, and what's happening in this so-called piece of fiction and our real lives, right? Like it could have been fun to be a fly on the wall when you all were negotiating that. But the, it did something about the whole theater experience for me to have to, and I, of course, I, don't, I personally don't have a problem with that, um, to show my vaccine card. I was kind of proud to show it. I'd never been asked for it before. I'm like, I have one. <laughs> and so does my husband. Um, but to wear my mask, to be respectful of all you were doing, in my opinion, to keep all of us safe while you're trying to conduct the business of your organization, it made me really think about how interesting it would have been to be a fly on the wall when you all were doing that and maybe inviting you all to use the play to sort of revisit how you arrived at the decisions that you arrived at and what might have come up for you as a leadership team. You know, we worked for, we met, uh, we had regular weekly meetings right. throughout the entire summer to talk about how we were gonna get to the experience that you had at the theater yeah. on, on Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had, you know, we had so many different ideas. Some of them we we chucked right during opening week. That you know, mm -hmm. because we were the the world kept changing. When we first started those conversations, the Delta variant wasn't a factor. Right. Well, now the Delta variant is very much a factor. And so yeah. we found after having done now we've done I think eight different performances for the public. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been very cooperative, very right. understanding, uh, and, and recognizing that if we're going to have things like live theater, if we're going to be able to assemble in a public space uh, and share common experiences and continue to reap the benefits of these kind of communal experiences that are have, have meaning in our lives, mm -hmm. we have to make certain compromises for the greater good. Just uh -huh. as the play points out, you know, we have right. to agree that if we're going to sit with strangers in a darkened theater, we're going to be okay being vaccinated and wearing a mask, right. Right. at least for now. And, 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 you know, in fact, uh, you know, we continue to have these meetings. We'll do evaluations. How did the weekend work? What worked? What didn't? Uh, but 95% of the folks who came down to the theater were very appreciative of the protocols and, and very happy to be back. And, and, and so, you know, we felt good about the protocols. Right. Uh, but you're, you're right. It's, there is a certain irony, isn't there, about experiencing this play the way we had to experience it. Exactly. And I also think what you described is, is really helps people envision the phrase that we use in my business, that leadership a lot of time is like building a bicycle and riding it at the same time, right? And the very moment you think the bike is pulled together, a screw falls off and forces you to think about something else. And so I just think it's just, there's sometimes where, you know, it's no accident that we are all watching this play in this moment in history and that you all organizationally are having to lead your way through the very moment the executive committee of the Eureka Day School is. And that, and, and I think in the end, as much as there was a lot of um, dynamics, right? Like Eli leveraged his capacity mm -hmm. as a major donor to basically set the policy for the school because they mm -hmm. needed his money, 
right? right. Which has a whole nother ethical conversation going on. Right. Um, right. They, as a board, decided to do what they believed or got compelled to do it by this money, what they believed was in the best interest of everybody, the majority mm -hmm. of people in their school. And the other thing that leaders have to pay attention to is when you get there, someone will leave. And that someone might be the longest time philanthropic person who made, made the lunches for the school, that person could leave, leave your organization and that's the other thing I'm help supporting leaders in getting through, because that's the fear. When mm -hmm. somebody on my board is feeling very strongly in opposition to this decision I have to make, and I'm afraid if I make the decision, they're going to leave. And the conversation we're having with them is, how are you going to navigate that, right? And so there are sometimes, dependent upon the situation where the question we're asking people is something in the spirit of, well, let's reflect this. As a leader, are you willing to allow the opposing idea or feeling of one person in your boardroom or one person on your team to derail something that you fundamentally believed after doing your due diligence, your hard work, getting all the evidence together to, to derail something that you believe is in the best interest of your organization? In the case of the Eureka Day Board, they made the decision and were willing to let Suzanne leave. What was visually interesting to me also is by the end of the play that that board was really predominated by people who were of varying uh, dimensions of diversity than they were in the beginning. So it went from being religiously diverse in Eli to Karina to the new black woman who entered the room right to Mako, and then there was Don. So even the visual of the board just became predominated by people who would in many ways be experienced as minorities. And then here's Karina wielding her power, right? So there was very much so interest in just that visual change in that boardroom. <laughs> Excuse me, it was fascinating. And to me, that allows the play to end on a note of hope. Yes. <clears throat> and optimism that right. she makes the case that we're all in this together. That's the last line of the play she has right. is that we are all in this together. Right. Uh, and we look at that empty bookcase where Suzanne's books all went away. Right. And we have we are optimistic that that Karina has marshaled the financial resources right. and the the philosophical and intellectual resources uh, to move things forward. At least that's the hopeful note that I take right. away. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, it really is. And it also gives you that visual. I often do this with my clients. Like I have them imagine, imagine what could happen in your organization if you with intention formed a board of directors that truly reflected the demographics of people either you are currently serving or you aspire to serve. And that's what happened. And the other thing now that I'm reflecting on this is that as much as Karina, I was looking at Karina like, Karina, manage yourself because your ego will take off, especially when you become the first only and different. You have to navigate things differently. The other thing that we witnessed was Karina finding her voice and her confidence as mm -hmm. a leader, right? right? And so that was really powerful that she really, it takes courage to, as a person of color, a woman of color, to do what she did. Because in a lot of cases, she's the person that gets asked to leave the board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you deal with a lot of who the hell do you think you are energy is what I call it. Understand but that. yeah, that was, I, there were many moments, I think, in that play that signaled to us that if we can find empathy, right, that it is important to have a set of visual espoused values and beliefs. You know, the whole point about empathy, the whole point about making room for new leaders, the whole point, even Don, although he was struggling with it, trying to create conversation, community conversation. Mm -hmm. Don's problem in that moment was he just didn't know how to manage it because it was right. funny as hell, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff going out of that chat was hysterical. I'm like, there it is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are so many moments. I, I feel like, um, I think you have to have total body experiences with theater, right? You need to see it, mm -hmm. feel it. 
You have mm-hmm. to look for the stuff that goes on and the nuances of it. Um, Mako's body language when they were kind of getting to that in her just knitting and shaking her foot, you know, not saying much, but saying a lot. Like right. I always inspire leaders that you have the total body listening. Listen, when you're trying to get to great decisions and the fact that they chose consensus as their sole decision-making mode made their work that much harder. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And poor Don was trying to get them there, but he really demonstrated how difficult it is to obtain consensus. And I always say to leaders that tell me that, are you sure you want to make that the only decision-making mode? Because it only fits for certain circumstances. That's right. right. It's best right. used in certain circumstances. It's not great for every circumstance. And That's in right. this case, I think his instincts were good. It's just that he didn't demonstrate a lot of ability around how to manage a consensus decision-making process when the topic is that hot. Right. And I don't think that that group, that group of fictional characters had ever been confronted by a topic that was that hot and that divisive, that struck to the core of who they saw themselves to be. Exactly. That was really the challenge for them. I didn't experience any of them as with maliciously intent, with malicious intent. They literally were humans having a human experience while they're leading and having to, like I said, they're pedaling and trying to put the bicycle together, pedaling and, you know, and that's what it's really like to be a leader. And it's really obvious in COVID, but I would offer for consideration that that is the truth of leaders every day that we are peddling every day about the budget, peddling every day about our staff, peddling every day, if you're in a not-for-profit about the board, right? Peddling every day, how do I really be the man or woman I want to be and lead this organization? Just peddling all day long. So all of the exasperation and the exhaustion is real. So uh, another thought that I would just share is I think it's critical that we be gentle with ourselves, Mm. right? I said that to the cast, right? And I said, I say that to you as a, as a client and a colleague, that we really have to learn to be gentle with ourselves around these issues because the decisions we're being challenged to make are unlike any decisions, in my opinion, for people that are leading right now that they've had to make before because of our age. Mm. Right. My mom grew up in the Jim Crow South, right? She watched people of her generation make difficult decisions. And they were doing the same thing, right? They were having the exact same leadership challenge. And the thing is, is that if we can embrace the fact that everything rises and falls on my personal leadership, what I say, how I show up, how people experience me, then I think it gives us, as we say in my company, the confidence, competence, courage, and calm to get in a lane and pedal the bicycle with other people. But I think the goal needs to be, I wondered about this, like how was Don feeling when he went home at night, right? (laughs) And I say to my clients, you know, when you go home tonight, take a moment to think about how did I, how did I do today? What did I do really well? What did I do not so well? Reflect on your mission, vision, and personal ones and values and say, okay, what am I going to do to get myself back on this bicycle tomorrow? Because that's Mm -hmm. all we can do. (laughs) Be gentle with yourselves, people. (laughs) Absolutely. And that's a good, that's a good takeaway from, from this Gwen is that we all need to be gentle with ourselves, particularly Mm -hmm. now. Exactly. And, and, and if we can learn that lesson and see that uh, reflected in our own work, then we've done something good. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so uh, I so appreciate your insight today and your reflections on this play. Thank you so Uh, much. It's given me a lot more to think about, and I know it'll give our audience a lot more to think about too. Uh, you're very kind to to give of your time and insight. So thank you so much, Gwen. This was a great conversation and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, um, Bob. And if I could just share with your your, um, audience members and those who support you, that sort of closing comment I had with the cast is in the end, I feel really strongly about us focusing on this question, right? And is what kind of ancestor do I want to be? What do I want to be known for in my life? What is it? What's the difference I want my life to make? And I think a lot of times we 
think about a question like that when we're on the cusp of going to glory, as we say in our house, transitioning from this world to another one. And I'm just inspiring leaders to start thinking about that now. What kind of ancestor do you want to be, right? What do you want to be known for? And I think when we get really grounded in that, it gives us the kind of courage and frankly, stamina that's needed to lead through a moment like this. And Eureka Day certainly challenged me to reflect on that um, and made me reconfirm my own commitment to wanting to um, be my, have, see my legacy in action right now. And I hope it inspires other people to do the same. It's hard, but every single thing you do is making a difference, especially if you're doing it based on your own desire to be known by the 10th generation of your family as someone who stood in their values and did the right thing. So I hope that inspires people to be, that is the reason to be gentle with yourself and just do the work. I hope so too. What yeah. a great insight to wrap up with today. That was fantastic. And right. something that we'll all take away as we reflect on this play and in our own work. Right. So Gwen, thank you so much. Thank you and for having me, Bob. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Eureka Day runs through October 31. If you haven't seen it, I hope this conversation has given everyone more insight uh, into the play. I hope you'll come and see Eureka Day and everything at Syracuse Stage. Gwen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope one thing I said inspires your listeners to uh, just a new level of leadership. I, I, I bet more than one thing. I bet several things. Thank you so much, Bob. Thanks, Gwen.